is great. So yes, welcome everybody. Um, so Rob's always given a short introduction to Vertical Veg. Yeah, it's about uh, inspiring and supporting growing food in containers and sort of highlighting that growing food can also be really beautiful. Uh, it can be very productive in small spaces in containers and it can also be wildlife friendly. And one of my passions really about Vertical Veg is as well as the actual growing is all the community sustainability and well-being benefits uh, that can be achieved by I mean, I think it's well known that gardening in general has those benefits, but I don't think it's quite so well known that just if you have a balcony, <laughs> uh, you can get the same benefits, you can get all those benefits as well. And so part of my work is really trying to aware, raise awareness that all these things can be, uh, you can achieve all these things from just a very small uh, space. Um, so what I'm going to do today is just, just share a few more about the, the benefits of growing at home. Uh, then. Growing is a funny thing because you can spend your whole life learning about it and you never know it all, but actually the essence of it is very simple and a few little bits of information can make a big bit of difference. So I'm going to share the sort of things that I think make the really the biggest difference between really will most help you to have success in containers. Um, and then I'm going to look at a few of the best things to grow. I mean, you can grow anything you like in a container, so don't let me deter you, <laughs> but there's a few things that work really well in small spaces, so I'll share those. And then I'll do a quick tour of, of the front yard. So it's going to be quite a flying uh, visit, but anyway. Um, so this is where I lived in London. I had this little balcony here. I really wanted to grow food, but I couldn't get an allotment. Uh, so I sort of slightly half-heartedly, I admit, just thought I'll just try it. Uh, in some containers and wasn't expecting too much um, but then uh, was really quite amazed to discover that we were eating food nearly every day from uh, the food that we could grow uh, it really changed the quality of the food we ate and one of my friends asked me how much did you grow he was a management consultant so he suggested I should measure it <laughs> so I did and it turned out that we grew about 883 kilos of food worth about 900 pounds. It's on the balcony and on the windowsills on the other side. Um, the reason why it's quite high value is partly because I use Waitrose prices, but then I thought, well, it's very high quality food, so why not? Um, but also because we grew a lot of salad leaves and a lot of herbs. So you can see like 144 packs of salad, equivalent 144 packs of salad leaves. Um, so this is just sort of highlighting, I hope that in a small space, you can actually grow enough food to make uh, quite a significant difference to the food that you eat and basically adds, adds something to almost every meal. Uh, we then moved up to Newcastle and uh, this is our current home and this is the case of a lot of houses in this city and I'm sure a lot of other cities around the UK. Uh, concrete spaces at the front and to be honest it's pretty bleak uh, particularly when you walk down a whole street uh, and it all looks like this concrete just seems to suck sort of life and humanity and you know they're not very nice spaces to be but when you fill it with vegetables uh, it just changes the whole feel of the space and as well as changing the feel of it it means you're you're out at the front you're visible and I'm endlessly chatting to people who <laughs> walk past who are intrigued and who ask questions but just the fact that I'm visible means I meet a lot more uh, people in the community um, but even if you don't have um, even if you don't have a space which is publicly visible and it's brilliant gardening in a space which is but even if you don't uh, container gardening at home can also give lots of opportunities to connect with others in your community. So we organise uh, in Newcastle, we organise uh, like plant swaps and street planting sessions. And this area where we're in, uh, no one's got gardens, everyone's got concrete backyards or concrete front yards, uh, but people still come together and we get all ages, uh, all sort of really diverse mix of people and it's just a lovely way for people to meet each other and uh, and share. Um, uh, you eat much better as soon as I mean, as all this has been proven. If you grow your own food, you tend to <laughs> eat a much better diet, and it just tastes so much better. I mean, I can't promise you. I promise you, if you've once you've had a salad like this, and this is really easy to grow. A lot of these are like microgreen sunflower shoots. Um, really really easy to grow nasturtium flowers and the flavor is just uh, is just fantastic and you'll find it hard to eat a supermarket salad 
uh, again. Um, another great thing when you start growing is you can start recycling all your waste food. And I know in some parts of the UK now, uh, the council will collect waste food and recycle it, but in many places they won't. Um, they still don't, they don't here in Newcastle, but uh, when you grow your own food, uh, wormeries are perfect for small spaces. Um, and it's really easy and it's really satisfying and it means you create fertilizer from your, your waste uh, food. And of course, as soon as you grow plants, wildlife starts coming. And that's obviously good for wildlife in, in cities, pollinators and things, but it's also good for us. You know, it's great to be able to live in the middle of a city and to be able to enjoy uh, bees and things. In fact, at the front of the house, we've now got a bee's nest, I think, which is a bit exciting. I don't quite know what sort of bee it is, some sort of bumblebee. <laughs> it's quite exciting. We're a bit scary because it's the place where I keep my pots and they did all come out the other day. Uh, looking quite excited. So I'm gonna now going to uh, to share uh, what I think of it. eight things that will really make a big difference to growing food in containers um, that make the most difference. Um, so the first thing is that a lot of urban spaces don't actually get full sun. Uh, and so it's really important to know what to grow in a space with less sun. And I couldn't understand when I started why when you bought packets of seeds, they didn't never seem to give you this, what I thought was quite a vital piece of information. Um, but uh, luckily, I, sort of, I worked out actually there's a really sort of simple sort of division. Um, now, in the whole, most vegetables, in fact, nearly all vegetables grow best in full sun. Um, but some really must have full sun to do well. And those are like all the Mediter Mediterranean uh, sort of subtropical uh, things, vegetables like tomatoes and aubergines, all the ones on the left hand side here. And also some of the fruits, uh, like you can grow hardy kiwis in the UK, um, but they do need full sun, peaches and apricots. So these things really do need, it's very hard to grow these things unless you have lots of sun. Um, with a bit less sun, about half a day's sun, that's five to six hours, uh, the root veg, pretty much all the root veg will grow well. Um, potatoes, carrots and things, and also peas and beans are good. And the other benefit of peas and beans is they go upwards, so often they reach more sun. Uh, and some of the fruits like apples and cherries will also grow well in about half a day's sun. Uh, if you have less summer mat, like three or four hours, there is still a lot you can grow, but you just need to be quite a bit more selective. Um, but basically all the leaves, uh, pretty much every leafy uh, vegetable, herb, even the sun loving herbs, the ones which are described as needing full sun, will nearly all actually grow fine in three or four hours, things like rosemary and basil. Uh, the flavour won't be quite as good, um, but it will still be, it will still be be great and often much better than, than you can than you can buy. And it's just so nice having them on your doorstep. And then all the woodland fruits, so blueberries, raspberries, uh, blackberries, rhubarb, red currants, black currants, gooseberries, all those fruits will all grow fine in three to four hours. So you've actually got quite a good choice in less sun. If you think of all the leafy vegetables, uh, salads, and, and actually these are some of the best things to grow in small spaces. So don't feel, if you haven't got a lot of sun, don't feel you can't still create a really great uh, edible edible garden. So this was my balcony. Um, I just wanted to show this because just to sort of, to, to sort of share really, but sometimes the amount of sun can vary considerably, even in a very small space. So on this balcony, um, it was northwest facing so most of it didn't get a lot of sun but there was one corner here which got more than six hours so there i've put a courgette and a tomato um the middle bit got about half a day five to six hours so there i've got uh, a runner bean uh more runner beans on this side and i've got potatoes because they were all things that will do well in half a day and then at the back it only got three three or four hours sun and where I've got salads. So what you need to do with the space is like observe it and identify which of the sunny bits, the sunniest bits where you can put the sun loving crops and which of the least sunny bits to put things like salads or at the very back here where we've got the least sun, I've got a water butt on one side and a wormery on the other side. Um, a good way to work out how much sun you've got is to take photographs 
every hour, every two hours during the day. I mean, you can see how the sun, obviously it needs to be on a sunny day, but uh, you can see how the sun patterns change. Now, that was my balcony. The other side of the house was full sun. And that's, this was a harvest one day from that side. As you can see, I grew all the sun loving crops on the other side of the house. Um, so the next thing which makes a big difference is the size of the pot. Um, and the reason why I like to mention this is that there's a lot of pictures on the internet of people growing uh, food in things like yogurt pots and milk bottles. And it's, it's, it's definitely possible to do that. Um, the thing is that it's just that it, it, they need a lot more care and attention, they need a lot more watering, and it's much easier to grow a healthy, strong pot, plant in a larger pot. So the reason that mint, for example, or all supermarket herbs, when you buy them, uh, tend to die quite quickly, <laughs> is that the pot that they come in is small, it's too small, really. Um, so if you if you replant a supermarket mint into a bigger pot like this, um, it will grow much, much bigger and it will last you for the rest of your life. If you want mint for life, all you need to do is buy one supermarket mint, put it in a bigger pot and then each year chop it in half or quarter and repot it. And you've got a mint plant to give away to one of your neighbours and you will just have an incessant, never ending supply of mint. So you can grow, so bigger pots generally are better, but you can grow some things if you haven't got space for big pots, um, you can grow some things in small pots uh, and basically small plants will grow in small plots. So microgreens are great in trays. So these are the mushroom trays you find thrown out quite a lot or you can collect up, just line them with paper, uh, fill them with compost, uh, and you can grow loads of microgreens. You can grow just from uh, dried seeds from a stored cu store cupboard. Um, these are sunflower shoots. I grow these from bird seed. Uh, you can buy that uh, very cheaply. Um, you need to get those sunflower seeds with the hulls on, uh, but sunflower shoots are delicious. Um, peas, dried peas, pea shoots are really delicious. Lots of things you can grow. And so small leaves, don't need, uh, you can grow those in smaller containers. Uh, but if you want to grow something big, uh, then you really do need a big container, particularly a big fruit like this tromba squash. And if you want to have some conversations with people on your street, I recommend growing this because people will uh, <laughs> almost certainly stop by and ask you what it is. Um, it's quite a fun one to grow. They literally do, that's in a container, they really literally do go over a meter, meter long. Um, Fruit trees also tend to need quite big pots. So this is an apple tree. I now I get over 100 apples a year from this. To begin with, I had it in a 20 litre pot, but I've just slowly, every couple of years, moved it into a bigger one. If there wasn't space for this size pot, I could be keeping it in a smaller one. But um, the bigger pot you can put it in, the happier it will be, um, the easier it will be to keep it well watered and the better um, harvest you will get from it. So the next uh, thing, number three, is that the compost that you use in the pots uh, really, really makes a big difference um, to how successful your plants are. And this is a harder thing when you start because compost all looks quite similar when you, if you're not used to um, working with it. So this is just an example. So this is tomatoes. Um, one is grown in a compost from a budget supermarket. Another one is grown in a really good brand of compost. And you can see here, uh, the brand's called Silver Grow. Peat-free, obviously, it's really important to choose peat-free compost. And if it doesn't say peat-free, uh, it may not be. Oh, well, it won't be, actually. Um, so this uh, one on the right, you can see it's much stronger, it's much greener. And the one on the left is, is much is much weaker. And the thing is, if you if you hadn't realised this, you might just think that you were your growing wasn't very successful, or the, or the plant wasn't very happy. And the, the only difference here is the type of compost. Now, the thing about cheap compost is it's not necessarily bad. So I'm not. Although this this sample from Aldi didn't perform as well, sometimes Aldi compost is quite good. It's just that compost is quite inconsistent. So the important thing to realize is that compost is an inconsistent product. 
and um, when you buy a good brand like Silvergrow, you're much is much more likely to be good quality. When you buy something like um, a cheaper one, it, it's much more variable. So just bear that in mind. So I'm not saying don't buy the, the cheap stuff, but don't buy lots of it all in one go because you might discover that you've got a bad lot. But do do try it, and you know if things grow well in it, then you know um, then stick with it. That's that's great. But I really like Silver Grow. Another uh, brand I really like is Fertile Fiber, which is made out of coir. Silver Grow, which is coconut fiber. Silver Grow is uh, mostly made in the UK, actually. Uh, mostly made out of composted wood chip, so it's pretty sustainable. And both these, I find, you can reuse year after year as well. So I've got some Silver Grow, which is five years old this year, and I've been growing tomatoes in it every year, and every year I've had a really good harvest. So, um, but the compost you use really does make a, a big difference. Um, you need to check the drainage um, because uh, roots need air to breathe and really the most important thing is just to make sure you've got holes in the bottom of your pot and that the water can run freely out of the holes. Sometimes if you put a pot down on a flat surface the flat surface actually blocks the holes uh, so you just need to be careful of that. Uh, the next thing is to space your crops um, give them enough space and the general rule is the more space the plant has I mean this is obvious but sometimes if you when you're starting off well it took me quite a long time to work these things out anyway maybe I'm a bit slow I don't know but the more space you give each plant the bigger it will uh, it will and the bigger it will uh, grow so um, if you sow plants really close together um, you will get a very um, quick harvest of very delicious small leaves but you won't be able to pick that very long because the, those plants will very quickly run out of steam um, so these are mixed mustards if you sow exactly the same mixed mustards but just give them sow them about like one centimeter apart the, the plants will grow bigger um, you'll get the proper leaf shape developing and you'll probably be able to pick this for like two or three weeks so you will get um, be able to have harvest over a longer period. Um, again, these are exactly the same mustards, but this time I've sown them like about uh, six inches apart. And in this case, um, you can see that they, they're growing to their full size. And when they're their full size, they'll also live for a much longer period of time. You can just pick the outer leaves. And if you sowed these in September, you would be able to pick these all through the autumn, all through the winter and probably into like May the next year. So this method of growing gives you a harvest over a much longer period. Um, there's no right or wrong way. Um, it's just different ways of growing and I do all three. So growing them really close together means you get a very fast harvest, um, but you have to keep sowing them for a supply. Um, this way you get a slower harvest, but it goes on for much longer. Uh, fruiting uh, vegetables, on the other hand, nearly all need space to do well. So, for example, most if you're growing a tomato, you would only put one tomato in a pot. Uh, so if it's just one tomato in each of these pots, you'd put one squash in most pots, one courgette. Um, the exception to that rule is runner beans and peas, which you can grow more of in a pot. So there's about, this is a supermarket crate and I grow a lot of my vegetables in those green or black crates which for supermarkets use for vegetables to slime them with newspaper and I've got about 12 beans in this and from one supermarket crate you can grow between five and ten kilos of uh, beans French beans or, or runner beans so they're a really good crop for for small spaces. Um, number six is to establish a regular watering routine I think everybody knows that um, plants need water to survive, um, but I think it's less well known that, um, that watering has a really big impact on plant health. So a lot of the uh, container gardens I come across which have the um, biggest sort of problems with disease and pests uh, tend to be the ones uh, which the underlying cause is often the plants haven't had enough water because when plants don't have enough water they get stressed 
and when they're stressed like us they get more prone to getting uh, pests and diseases plants are basically pretty amazing you know healthy plants that are well fed and well watered can fend off most uh, predators or at least they won't do them that much damage um, but when they get stressed and unhealthy they're easy easy prey so watering is really key to that the other thing which affects is the flavor and a really common thing that happens is i'll show you um now, so people grow microgreens. So this is a tray of um, fava beans. Now, when you first sow this tray, the seeds, the seeds aren't really going to need much water because they're just like, you know, they're just germinating. They're tiny. But as these plants grow, and particularly we've grown lots in the, in the space, they're going to start drinking more and more water. And you can really see this. If you flip this upside down and look at the roots, you can see what an amazing root system has developed in this tray. So these plants are all drinking like loads of water and the really easy thing to do when you're starting off is not to realize how much more water they're drinking and not for them not to have enough and when that happens the the, the microgreens from being really tender and tasty go tough and bitter so if you have salads which taste tough and bitter um, a, the, the most likely reason for that is that they haven't had enough water um, the same with potatoes, so you sow a potato and it won't need that much water, but when it gets to this sort of size, big and bushy, um, it's going to be re respiring a lot of water and it's really going to need, you need to can keep a lot more careful eye on the watering when it gets to this, this size. And the secret really is just to have a regular routine. So mine is to, first thing in the morning, uh, I go out and do the watering and Oh, well, it's a lovely way, you know, if you're in the right mindset, it's a lovely way to start the day, um, you know, just reflect on everything, enjoy nature, see what you might be, see what might be ready to eat for supper that night. Um, yeah, so just having a daily routine, uh, really, uh, when I first started off, I keep, kept forgetting to water, and it was once I had a routine that um, that made it a lot easier. It doesn't really matter what time of day, morning is really good, but any time uh, is is okay. Now feeding plants um, is really important in containers. Uh, if they're not fed they won't grow optimally and this is a little experiment I did a few years ago where I got some old compost so this had been used for two seasons so it didn't have very many much food left in it and in these pots I planted some baby salad seedlings so they'd already grown to about three inches tall I move the salad seedlings into these pots and I fed each pot with a different uh, feed. So for example, the one in the bottom right, I gave some chicken manure pellets, which are very good, uh, useful uh, fertilizer. Um, but the one on the left, the black one at the bottom, I just watered, didn't feed it at all. And hopefully you can see the difference that that all the ones that were fed really grew productively whereas the one the bottom left the black one hardly grew at all um, but the interesting thing is that they actually look quite healthy apart from that they just didn't grow um, so if your plants just aren't growing often there, there may, may well be because um, they need uh, they need feeding so this is a really big topic but i'm just going to share with you um, a few of the sort of basics around feeding. Um, so I think of it as being three pillars. The first pillar is nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. So these are elements that plants in the same way that we need protein, carbohydrate uh, and fat. Uh, these are the equivalents, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. The chemical abbreviations are NPK. And whenever you buy a fertilizer from a shop, it will have it will tell you how much NPK it has in it of each one. Uh, the second pillar is minerals and trace elements in the same way that we need a wide range of different uh, vitamins and that sort of thing, so do plants. And then also just like us, the way we need bacteria in our gut, uh, plants need uh, bacteria and fungi in the soil. So this is the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And if you can remember it, it's really worth trying to remember this because it is useful to know. Uh, so NPK, another way of remembering it is shoots, roots and fruits because the nitrogen is good for leaf growth, uh, the phosphorus is, is useful for root growth 
and the potassium is is good for fruit growth now all plants need all three of these but if you're growing a crop mainly for its leaves then you ideally want to feed which is high in nitrogen uh, and if you want to grow a plant which is mostly fruiting you want to feed it a feed high in potassium now there's options here you can make your own so for example high nitrogen feed is nettle tea um, a high potassium feed is comfrey tea which you can make your own or you know and that's a brilliant thing to do if you've got the time and resources but sometimes you know if you've got a busy job and you live in the middle of the city actually collecting nettles is not very practical or very easy thing to do um, so you know there are other options so you can buy ticket manure pellets i've mentioned before um, which are really good they're high nitrogen um, and you you can tomato feed is very widely um, available um, so you know there's no right or wrong way to do it um, but there's, you know, it's obviously nice to use natural things and find them, make them yourself. But if time doesn't permit, then um, yeah, so this is tomato feed. And basically tomato feed is good for all, I don't know why they call it tomato feed, because basically it's good for all fruiting crops. So your blueberries, your squash, uh, your runner beans, uh, all those things uh, it's good for. Uh, I've already mentioned chicken manure pellets, high in nitrogen, um, there are vegan equivalents for all these things. So a vegan equivalent for chicken manure pellets is rape seed meal. Uh, you just have to find it. So rape seed meal has got the similar uh, makeup. It's high in nitrogen, um, uh, but uh, rape seed meal is is is, is very similar. Um, liquid seaweed. This is like vitamins for plants. It's brilliant, and um, the most efficient way to use it is to put it in a spray bottle and spray it on the leaves. Uh, of the of your plants and um, yeah you can really see plants grow stronger if you spray the leaves uh, with some uh, liquid uh, liquid seaweed uh, and absolutely fantastic my favorite of all is worm compost uh, worm compost is amazing stuff because it is high in uh, those major uh, nutrients for nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. It also contains minerals and it contains soil life. So it contains everything plants need. In fact, it's very high in all the soil life in bacteria and fungi. So this is a, a brilliant thing. And you'll notice that plants not only grow um, bigger and more strongly, but they also grow much healthier. I had many much fewer uh, pests and diseases when I started using worm compost. So if you don't have a phobia of worms, and some people do, um, and you know, it's a, it's a real thing. Um, but if you don't have a phobia of worms, then um, these are, this is, and you've got the space, uh, starting a wormery is absolutely brilliant. And you can put all your waste food in there uh, as well. And these are just some homemade uh, Fertilizers are made, made out of all sorts of different things. Um, there's a brilliant book. Um, I'm trying to remember his name, Nigel. Uh, I can't remember his name, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Nigel. <laughs> uh, but it was a brilliant book on making your own fertilizers. Uh, and it's uh, basically, instead of adding water, which is very smelly, you mix nettles with sugar and the nettles ferment down and you make this fantastic fertilizer. Um, or you can soak things in vinegar. So this is mussels uh, soaked in vinegar, mussels dried out in the oven, then soaked in vinegar, and all the minerals from the mussels go into the vinegar. And Nigel Palmer, that's the person. Uh, Nigel Palmer has got a great book on making your own fertilizers. And there's a lot of these things you can find in the city. Um, so that's, that's really fun to be able to do that, feed plants with things that you found or recycled. Okay, and then the next number eight is just to keep learning. So before, um, because there's always more to learn and don't worry when things go wrong. That's the other thing, because I think sometimes gardening programs, when you look at, when you go down to my garden, you'll see lots of things going wrong actually. So I might try and hide them from you though. Uh, the, um, uh, what was I gonna say? Um, yeah, but yeah, don't, but don't worry because things do go wrong. Gardening programs often hide the fact that things go wrong and it's just natural and just try and learn from it because often there's something, when something goes wrong, there's normally something you can um, learn from learn from that. So I'm just going to quickly look at some things that grow really well in small spaces. 
um, first of which is microgreens. And the reason there's so many reasons these are really good. I mean, partly because they're very low cost to grow. So these are just grown from dried peas uh, from a supermarket. And these trays are obviously just like recycled trays. Um, so they're low cost to grow. Um, they're really fast to grow. So these you can grow these in only two weeks. Um, they're very, very productive because the, the trick is to sow them very close together. So you put lots of peas in a tray and you're basically harvesting two or three bags, equivalent of two or three bags of salad off one tray. So if you look at these trays here, you've actually got a lot of food in a small space. And uh, they're also highly nutritious. Um, often they have a lot more uh, nutrition in them more, um, than the actual adult plants. And uh, last but not certainly not least, they are delicious. Another benefit, they don't need much sun. So actually these are growing in a backyard I had that got no direct sun at all. Um, they are better with a bit of sun, but they, they don't need a lot of sun. So they're basically just, uh, they're just great. Uh, and there's loads of different ones you can grow. Um, lots you can grow from spice packs and things. Uh, these are nasturtiums, they're very nice. Um, this is auric, which is very pretty. Uh, these are mixed mustards here, um, but you can grow things like coriander from spice packs, fenugreek from spice packs. Uh, so you can grow a lot of diversity and you can grow a lot in a small space. The only thing about them is that you have to keep sowing because a tray, particularly in warm weather, will only, you can only pick it for like a week or two. In cooler weather, so in the autumn, they go on, go on for a lot longer. Um, but anyway, this is a great way to grow a lot of food, very flavorful uh, in a small space. Um, the second thing which is brilliant is herbs. And these are sort of the other end of the scale in terms of maintenance, because basically you just plant these and just that's it really, mostly. Um, you need to water them. Um, and every one or two years, they really benefit from being repotted. I often meet people who say their mints died or something it hasn't struggled. And, and the reason is that it just runs out of energy being in one pot. So you need to take it out of the pot, chop it in half, repot it with some new compost and it will keep going. Um, and I mentioned liquid seaweed before. If you get some liquid seaweed, that is actually really good for herbs. Although they're not very hungry, they often come from environments where there are a lot of minerals in the soil. Uh, so feeding liquid seaweed can really help to grow like strong, lush, uh, healthy herbs. Uh, and this is a growing ladder. So this is a good way if you haven't got very much space, um, you can basically create a whole herb larder um, in not much space at all. So I've got some sorrel down here and some mint. Um, but, you know, even if you just have a windowsill, so this was a windowsill in a flat I lived in London. So we've got mint, chives and parsley and just that on its own, you know, it's lovely to be able, you know, you better pick that, probably have herbs probably every night from those three, uh, three containers. Um, so, you know, I mean, if herbs transform your food really probably more than anything else. And they're not the sort of thing you would necessarily buy regularly from the shops. Salads are very good. These are supermarket crates I mentioned before. I use a lot of these. Uh, this is Rocket. You can sow it. This is sort of grown halfway between full sized plants and halfway between microgreens. So I've sown it very thickly, which means you just get like a lot of crop um, off a small space. But you wouldn't be able to grow it for that long because it will run out of steam. But for getting lots of uh, rocket quickly, it's great. Uh, edible flowers, things like nasturtiums are great, but all salads are really good. Um, I love nasturtiums just because, you know, you've got the flowers and the leaves are really tasty and the flowers are really tasty. Um, leafy veg is very good. So chard, kale. Uh, I've got some chard, which is just ending in the garden at the moment. Um, but this is good because you can sow this in July and it will go all through the year or winter and right up till now. So the child outside in the garden, I've already been picking for like about a year. So I'll show you that in a minute. It's looking a bit sad, but has been going for a whole year. So it's done pretty well. Kale's very good. Um, and uh, fruits are... Um, 
these are more long term, so they take longer to establish. So it might take a few years really before an apple tree is very productive. But if you're settled in a place, um, they're an excellent choice because it's just well, it's just really nice having fresh fruit on your doorstep, and they're relatively. You know, you don't have to go and all vegetables, you have to sow them every year. So they're quite labor intensive. Um, whereas fruits, you know, you don't have to sow them every year. You just have to repot them every two or three years into a bigger pot. But they add quite a lot of structure. Um, and the blossom in the spring is really good for the insects and it's really pretty. So a few, few fruit trees, if you've got space in a container garden, um, it's nice. But the keys really are getting the right variety for containers. So sometimes people buy the sort of bargain ones from uh, Aldi and things. And you can do that. But the thing is, it, because you could have it for 10, 20 years, I would really recommend going to a specialist fruit nursery and getting them to getting their advice and getting a, a, a variety which is really suitable for a container and suitable for the climate in the part of the country where you are. Um, because the rootstock is important as well and you know when you buy them from a, um, the supermarkets and stuff they aren't necessarily going to have the right rootstock for a container um, and the other secret of growing fruits is just patience you know because it does take a few years so this apple tree gives us over 100 apples a year uh, but it's about 10 years old now it's been very productive for about the last five um, this is just an example where the variety is really important so raspberries are great in containers um, but this particular variety, Glencoe, it fruits on this year's growth. Um, so you get a lot of uh, fruit every year without having to grow um, extra canes, which you do with uh, summer raspberries. Rhubarb. OK, just going to give you a few veg examples when I'm going to go outside. Uh, runner beans are excellent. So this is just one harvest of two crates of runner beans and French beans, uh, tomatoes. And if you like chilies. I can't recommend enough. And you've got a sunny space. You can basically be grow. I mean, one chili plant will grow nearly 100 chilies if it does well. So that's, you know, that's two a week from one plant. And you can you can dry them. So if you have a few plants, uh, you can grow enough chilies to, um, yeah, keep you busy. And uh, if you want more information, I have a website uh, where you can subscribe and I send out monthly, you know, this is what you can do this month, what to sow and things this month, just as a reminder and tips and stuff. Um, and yeah, but as Rob mentioned, I've just recently written a book, which is a sort of comprehensive book about how to grow and how to overcome the challenges of growing in a small space and the best crops and things. Anyway, I'm now going to go outside and give you a tour of my garden. So I'm just going to get set up one second. So I'm just going to stop sharing here and mute myself on this one and then I'll get set up on my other. So I shall give you a tour of, oh good, I have got my keys. <laughs> I thought for a moment I just locked myself out. I haven't, that's right. So uh, I'll just give you a little tour of what we've got around here. Um, so this is coriander uh, and I grow this in these big trays and so very thickly, this is just, uh, coriander seed from spice pack um, and what I do is I sow it very thickly like this but then thin it out uh, and yeah this gives a really good supply of coriander uh, and I don't worry when it flowers because it will do in a few weeks time because the insects absolutely love it. Um, it's in a slightly funny time of year at the moment because it's sort of in between here in Newcastle it's too still too cold to put things like tomatoes and runner beans out so it, everything's a bit in transition um, so this is a raspberry, the Glencoe purple raspberry in pot down here. Um, that's very productive, produces lots of raspberry. This is a, a blackberry, and you might think it's a bit strange having a blackberry because you can pick them in the wild. But the nice thing about this one, it's called Lock Hay, is it fruits in July. So in early July, we can uh, pick raspberries. And my daughter actually don't get that many. My daughter and the blackbird fight for them, so sometimes we net them from the blackbird, but uh, yeah, that gives us lots of uh, blackberries. What else have we got here? The rhubarb, this is coming to an end now. So it's like, I mean, it will be, we will pick a few more later on uh, in the year, but um, the big stalks have already been picked. That's really good, like early in the year, sort of uh, March time. Uh, and we've got another 
purple raspberry here. What have we got coming down here? So yes, to go not just, well, you can eat roses, but because we're on the road, lots of passers by, I have to grow a few flowers to uh, make it look pretty. And of course you can uh, dry roses and eat them. I've uh, got some peas coming up here. They'll look really pretty. They'll climb up this big bam and nice pink flowers by the side of the road. Uh, blueberries here. So you can see we're going to have lots of blueberries flowering nicely there. Uh, blossom. This is kale. It's really finished, the kale, but as you can see, it's flowering and seeding. But I just, the bees love the um, flowers. So I just leave it for another week or two. Uh, and then I'll probably put a courgette or something like that. So these are the supermarket crates that I've just hidden behind a wooden board so that when we go out onto the street, I'll probably be accosted by someone in a minute, I often am. Um, yeah, so it just needs painting actually, but uh, you can see just trying to hide the fact that I'm growing in crates. More flowers here, these are biodas, edible flowers. This is the chard, which is sort of coming to an end now. Um, it's bolting, but still quite a lot on there to pick and eat. So uh, I'll be eating those over the next few days, and then I'll replant that container very soon as well. One of the one of the fun things actually is when you start growing. I'll show you this here. I'm quite proud of this. Things start growing on the street. So look, this is my chives. They have seeded in the pavement. Isn't that cool? <laughs> But all sorts of things growing down there. I had Oric 100 yards up the road once, quite fun. Uh, this is a little pond in a basin. Occasionally a frog comes in there, doesn't live in there, but it just has a little bar. Birds like it as well. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, some more peas. This is a wonderful herb, this thing here, it's called Scots Lovage. You can see it growing wild in Scotland. Um, it tastes like lovage, um, but it's not such a big plant as normal lovage. It's really good in soups as a base. And these flowers are edible and delicious. One of my favorite herbs, this one. And it's so easy, it just um, comes back every year. Now, this is a supermarket min plant, but I put it in a bigger pot. As you can see, it's pretty massive now. Just have to divide that every year to keep it going. Oregano, so this is like a herb ladder, yeah. Full of different uh, mint chives are nice. So these are, you can see the bees. That actually that might be one for me. I think that's one of the bees which is nesting underneath. Anyone knows what sort of bee that is? It's nesting in my garden. So yeah, the bees love that. Um yeah, just lots of herbs here. This is a really nice one. This is called uh, to Bagia fairy star and this flowers like this from now right until November and these flowers have a very strong garlic taste um, they're delicious they're really pretty in salad uh, and uh, yeah it's just a really pretty really pretty plant so I love that one uh, what else have we got um, these are three cornered leeks these are little white have a pot of them around here. Coming to an end now. These these flower all winter actually, so they're a nice one to have because. Um, but the leaves like basically they're like chive-like leaves. They're called three corners because I don't know if you can see, but they're sort of like three sides to them. Um, you, can, you can use them like chives in a dish. You can eat the flowers. They're nice. You just have to be careful of this because it's very invasive. So in containers, it's great, but if you don't plant it in your garden it will be everywhere. Um, this is just another little ornamental. Uh, got some fennel here. Oh, fennel's brilliant for wildlife because the flowers, hoverflies and things, absolutely love it. Um, this is the cherry tree and plum tree. I've only got those last year, so they're just establishing, so they're going to take a while. This is a wine berry, which is self seeds itself. And the wine berry around here. Plants are amazing, you know, it just decided it was going to grow in this pot. So I'm going to dig that one out and give it away to someone. We've got that in here. So these, are, these are called Japanese wine berries. Uh, they fruit in like uh, August time. And um, yeah, 
they're, they're, they're just really uh, a bit like a raspberry, but a bit sweeter. Um, and they ramble everywhere. And uh, they're really good. This is a nice thing to have for wildlife in space, bird bath. And we can see that from inside and endless joy from fun watching the antics of the different birds uh, in there. This is the apple. See that's in quite a big pot now. Um, but that's uh, quite good. Another blackberry down here. And um, this is a Chilean guava, which produces little red fruits, which look a bit like red blueberries, but taste a little bit like strawberries. And um, it's famous for being Queen Victoria's favorite fruit. But the thing which is really good about it is it. The fruits are like ready in November time, November, December. So, you know, from this garden, we get fruits of some sort for quite a lot of the year. Having said that, well, we've got rhubarb at the moment and the raspberries are not far off. Uh, but yeah, so I normally grow lots of microgreens here, but I've been away a lot recently, so I haven't got that many. These over the top are because the birds, particularly the blackbirds, um, they have different names in the garden. The blackbirds are known as the scutchlers because they run around here underneath. I've put these, some of the plants on pallets just because it gives a bit of height and it also um, sort of defines, creates more sort of defined areas. Um, but the height I quite quite like. Um, it doesn't have to bend down as much as well. But I'll show you this one here, you see, had a bit of metal mess over the top of this. It's only really when the seedlings in and it fell off and so the blackbird dug up all that part because he goes in because I have so many worms in the garden. The blackbird goes in there um, and scuttles around and digs it up. So I'll show you my wormeries now. So you can buy wormeries, of course, um, but actually all you need is a box. And the wooden box is the best of all. And this is just a box I made out of some old scaffold planks. It's got a wire base, mesh base, so the air flows. But we put all our banana skins, that sort of thing in here, uh, cardboard. And, but I also just put some nettles in actually. Uh, would the comfort on them uh, that really sort of speeds it up? Uh, it's actually, I can't think it was really hot, but you can probably see there are there are literally thousands and thousands of worms in here. So, if I can find a good bit, sometimes you find like a whole but yeah. It smells, doesn't smell at all. Well, it does smell, but it smells like just earthy. It's really nice. And the compost it makes is, I can't tell you, it's absolutely fantastic. And it's much easier. If you've got space to make a box like this, it's much, a wormery this size is much easier to look after than the little plastic ones. I mean, little plastic ones are okay, but it's just easier to look after uh, a big one. Um, and I put all the, as well as, because it's big enough, I can put all the, um, say things like all the rhubarb leaves and, uh, you know, when, when I cut those tails down at the front, um, I will put all of that will go in here. So everything, there's no waste space, you know, everything gets uh, recycled and the cardboard on the top is just because worms like the darkness. So, uh, good. Oh, one thing about uh, wormeries is you just need to be careful of rats. So that's why the brick goes on the top so they can't lift the lid off. Right. Well, I think uh, if there's anything, do you have any questions while I'm out here? Or uh, this is the hardy ginger, which is just about to come up. Uh, it just is looking a bit of a mess because I just gave some of it away for a swap last night. But this will grow right, it doesn't need any sun. It grows about six foot tall 
and it will fill this whole space here. You can see it looks looks quite wild when it comes up. It's just these shoots coming up here. Um, okay, right, I'm going to... There are quite a lot of questions for you, but we can ask you those when you're back inside. Okay, great. Okay. Right, well, I shall turn off this one then and uh, come back inside. Okay. I'll see you in a minute. Hey, Mark, welcome back. Hi, yeah. It was quite quiet, wasn't it? The builders were, were very good. It was very nice of them. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like we've just been to the Garden of Eden. Oh, uh, and back. So there's so there's a so there's a good there's a good lot of maybe we'll just start and work our way through them. We've got uh, we've got a little while. So, Mark, is there a particular reason? This is Dan's question. Actually, Dan, do you want to ask your question? I'm muting your question about concrete. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, hi, Mark. Thank you very much uh, for that and for the tour. Um, so yeah, my, my question was about when you moved to the, the house in Newcastle, you showed a photo of the uh, the kind of front garden area that was just concreted over. Is there a particular reason why you decided to carry on growing in containers rather than have the concrete removed so that you could grow directly in the ground? Only okay. The only reason really is, well, I guess there's, there's a few reasons, but um, the main reason really is that I had developed such an interest in container gardening. And I was also aware that there's loads of people in this city who have concrete backyards, concrete front yards, who, you know, it's a big job getting all the concrete dug up and replaced with normal soil. And I guess I'd set it as my mission to encourage and support people to grow food in containers. So to do that, I felt I needed to know as much as possible about growing in containers and the nice thing about that space is it's loads bigger than my um, um, balcony was so it means I've been able to try a lot more different things so I've been able to grow a lot more different fruits and that sort of thing so it was really just because I wanted to learn about growing in containers um, but yeah it is also a big job I mean it is a big job getting all that concrete up and it would all be hardcore and stuff there so it would all need to be shipped out in a skip I mean you'd need to probably buy a few tons of um, topsoil to replace it with so it would be possible to do and it would be fun to do but yeah no, I just decided that to uh, keep with the tech containers for now okay thank you so there was a question about people were quite taken with the comfrey uh comfrey feed conversation and uh and how smelly it can be I think that very much depends if you make it in water or if you just make the leaves just in a bucket without any water, it's much less smelly. But people were asking how much feed, how much should you give them? How much is too much? How much is too little? Yeah. So um, there is a way of making it which is no, which isn't smelly at all, and that is if you chop the comfrey up and mix it with an equal weight of sugar and pack it down into a jar and then put another layer of sugar on the top. So ideally organic brown sugar, if you can get it. Um, and then in about a week's time, it ferments and you get an amazing liquid feed off it, which I promise you smells pretty much good enough to drink. I haven't drunk it, but it smells good enough to drink. Um, and that's very concentrated. You don't need very much. I mean, basically a teaspoon in a watering can would be all you would need. Um, and I would probably use it as a foliar feed as well as a root drench. So put it in a spray bottle and spray it on the leaves. Um, but with the when you're making it in a watering, you know, in a bucket of water, it's it's very hard to be very specific about quantities because you know there's so many variables <laughs> in terms of how much comfort you've added and how much water you've added, how strong it is but generally you dilute it like you know if you've made it in a bucket you dilute it 10 to 1 20 to 1 something like that I mean as a general rule I think it's better to feed more regularly more dilute feed more regularly so quite often what I do is I have a bucket by my water butt I didn't show you my water butt actually I've got a thousand litre water butt at the front there is I have a bucket by the water butt which is full of weeds and all sorts of things and 
I fill it up with water and I let all the weeds sort of like rot down there. I and mean, every time I'm watering the plants, I just put a little slop of that mixture into the watering can. And that just adds a little bit of food. Partly you're feeding the plants, but also you're feeding the soil life in the soil. So when you add that sort of mixture, you're just adding something uh, that will uh, feed the soil life and make them make them active. So yeah, that would be my sort of recommendation is to sort of pretty dilute, but regular. Thank you. So there was a question I put in, which was about, so you talked about how you sowed seeds from spice packs. So I always, I always assumed that things like that were sort of treated somehow so they wouldn't grow. Is that not the case? So it's basically anywhere where you can buy coriander, so a bag of coriander seeds, a bag of whatever, you know, sunflower seeds that, that you would buy in a, in a kitchen, in like in a food place, you could sprout most of those, could you? Yeah. Yeah, you could. The only thing with sunflower seeds is that quite often when you buy them in a food place, but they don't have the hulls on them. And the odd one will grow without a hull on it, but generally they grow much better with the hulls on. But all things like um, coriander, the, the main thing is just how fresh it is. So if it's been hanging around in the shop or the back of your cupboard for like two or three years, it won't grow very well. But yeah. if it's reasonably fresh, it will grow uh, brilliant. I mean, it's amazing what you can find, particularly if you've got an Asian store near you. I mean, my Asian store sells basil seeds, which is amazing because it's used as a spice in India, basil seeds. And so you can buy, I worked out like, a, I get like a, like a 200 gram, maybe it was a hundred gram bag for like five pounds, I think, but a hundred grams of basil seeds from a <laughs> bought the equivalent of, from a, from a, a seed merchant would cost you about 500 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, yeah, but there's all sorts of things you can get. Yeah, fenugreek could come into mustard. Um, but it's quite a fun way, really, to just to to grow a diversity of, of things. Yeah. So Richard Richard asks whether the supermarket knows that you've got all their crates. Oh <laughs> uh, well, they don't because they came from a food bank. I mean, the, the thing about the crates is they do come from. Yeah, I mean, they're one of those, I've a lot, I often say to people, the thing with recycling is you've just got to use what you can get hold of and what you find. And when you start looking for something specific, it's normally impossible. Uh, so when I don't want them, I normally find them. So I was actually giving them, so a food bank here had just like loads and loads of them and the supermarket wasn't collecting them. So they just gave them to me. Um, but I have subsequently found the odd one, you know, lying around in back lanes and stuff. But if you want them specifically, you might find it difficult to get them. But, you know, there's loads of things you can use. You know, central, if you can find a skip um, where plumbers dump all their stuff in, like, um, you know, they dump in things like, you know, the tanks from um, when people have new condensing boilers put in, the tanks in the, in the attics uh, where the water was kept are, like, thrown out. And those big plastic tanks are very good. Um, old recycling bins, like sometimes some councils have stopped using the 50 litre ones. Um, those are really good. Um, there's basically lots of things you can find uh, when you keep your eyes open. Uh, so it's just about using what you can really. So Chris was asking about the, which was a surprise to me as well, about how you said that you used the compost in your containers for a number of years. Something fresh to it? or something, add something, and how could you tell when it's when it's time to replace it? Can you just keep mulching it on the top with some new stuff, or do you need to get it all out and get new? Um, you can just, I mean, there's, there's two things that happen with compost as it gets older. One is that, the first thing is that the nutrients run out. That's the most, that's the most pressing thing. So you need to add nutrients back in, and basically you can add anything, as long as you sort of slightly think about what you're growing. So if you're growing a leafy crop, I mentioned chicken manure is quite useful, but a vegan equivalent rapeseed meal, um, you mix that in, it will that will add the nutrients that the plant needs in. Um, or you could add worm compost. It doesn't really matter what, because you know if you think in the wild, all sorts of things go into the soil. It's just about thinking that the nutrients are going to be used up. Uh, and often the more diversity, you know, the more wide range of things you can add, the better. Um, so if you've got access to some dried seaweed or whatever, that would be um, 
good as well. So that's the first thing you need to do is you need to add some nutrients and then you can keep on feeding it as the plant grows. So you can use the, use the liquid feeds that we've uh, talked about just now, the nettle juice and, or you can buy, you know, you can buy fish, very good fish emulsions, uh, fertilizers made from waste fish, you know, the bones and stuff from, from fish. I mean, you can make your own, you can make your own fish. I go to the, we've gone to the market uh, and get fish, uh, splitted fish, you know, the bones from them. And then you can do the same thing with sugar. You can mix it with sugar and it ferments and you get a nice liquid fish fertilizer. So you, you can also add the feed that way. But then the other thing that you need to think about is that the structure of the compost over time um, starts to, the air gaps in the compost are really important uh, because the plants need oxygen. And as the compost gets older, the bits get smaller and wore down. So the air gaps can get smaller. So sometimes what you need to do is add something into the compost, which is more, uh, more sort of lumpy to sort of open up the holes again. So you can buy stuff called composted bark, um, a place called Melcourt make it, which is quite nice sort of, because it's not too big lumps, um, but they're sort of small bits and you mix that into your compost and it just adds uh, some nice air and oh, you can just use fresh just add in some fresh compost but something that is going to like open up the air gaps again um, but yeah as I said the, the, I've been using some coir and some composted wood chip uh, for four years and tomatoes last year even though you're not supposed to grow them with tomatoes in, well, in theory you're not supposed to grow compost tomatoes in the same compost every year I've grown tomatoes then then for four years and last year was the best ever <laughs> so you definitely can reuse it. I have this mental picture of coming around to your house and being in your kitchen and be like oh that's, this is beautiful what's this and <laughs> some disgusting and sugar that you've had fermenting there with fish bones. Um, <laughs> there's a question about... It doesn't about, smell, though. That's the amazing thing about the fish thing. Uh, it doesn't smell, which is quite extraordinary. Yeah, I can imagine it could be quite tasty, actually. Um, <laughs> so there's a question... So, so Rakesh is asking about whether whether you there are some things that you take indoors for the winter, particularly asking about the chili and guava. Does that stay out all year? Uh, or do you, are there some things that you bring in and sort of tuck in for the winter? Uh, no, it all stays. It all stays out outside. I, I did try overwintering my chilies this year, um, which was successful on one level, but not on another level. The reason why I've discovered that professional growers don't overwinter their chilies is that they can harbour um, aphids. So that everything in my house has now got aphids because they overwintered on the chilies. <laughs> oh dear. Um, okay. But, but that's the only thing, no, everything I'm afraid to say, I used to put fleece over things as well, but I just, to be honest, just can't be bothered. <laughs> I haven't got time, so I just leave them and it doesn't things just get on, yeah, I just leave them outside, yeah. There's a few questions about whether a worm composter on that scale attracts rats. Is it possible to oh, keep yes. the rats away? They do, completely? they really do attract rats. And I did have a rat in that composter and it was one of the, gave me such a shock <laughs> opened it and it gave the rat quite a shot as well the rat jumped about the rats can jump about like six feet in the air and it's like we almost like met face to face so it wasn't very nice but um the the, the, the key is that it needs to be rat proof and the reason it that one wasn't is that i've got a wire mesh at the bottom and the wire mesh had like slipped slightly and they like got through a hole in the bottom so i then repaired the mesh and now when i make them i make particular um effort i sort of put double wire mesh in and really make sure it's firmly secure because as long as you've got wire mesh with a fine they need to be you need to look i think i can't remember it's like two centimeters or something rats can squeeze through so it needs to be smaller than that um so as long as it's um yeah as long as it's, that wire mesh is small enough diameter and it's firmly enough fixed then you won't get them in there and, and i mentioned that about lid i've got a um a brick on it so that they can't um they can't move it and um, they can't get in thank you thank you uh yeah Gemma has a great comment about working as a volunteer at a food waste charity and is inundated with uh food uh, boxes the, the the crate things so she says there's never a shortage of those uh Richard that's, do you that's have where I got mine from so it's good that's what people need to find yeah so it's like you okay. know yeah but yeah go great yeah uh Richard you had a question about 
planting directly or sowing seeds? Do you want to ask that one? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Um, just a question. You just talked about compost, compost, compost. Um, do you just plant into compost and grow in compost, or worm compost or otherwise? Or do you use mixes? And if so, what kind of mixes? How much do you get into that kind of thing? Yeah, so compost is a really confusing term, isn't it? Because it's used for like lots of different things. So I buy, I start off, my main base is bought compost, um, which either could be, so I like that silver grow because it's composted bark and it seems to last really well. Um, and it's made in the UK. I occasionally use coir, which is coconut fiber, which is also excellent, but it has a slightly higher footprint because it's shipped from uh, places like Sri Lanka. Also, I feel it's a bit like, I'm not sure about the ethics of moving all the organic matter from Sri Lanka to wealthy countries like um, the UK. So I'm slightly hesitant about that, but it's a very good um, product. Uh, but that's the sort of starting base, but then once that's in the pots, then it's sustained by mixing in things like uh, worm compost. So I use the worm compost more to like sustain it and keep it going. Um, I do know people who do make all their comp own compost to, to grow in. It's, it's quite skillful to get it Oh, well, people do it, you know, I don't, there's a bit of luck, I think, as well. It depends on slightly what you've got access to, but it is possible. But you need, I think you need more space. It's quite hard in a very small space, like a balcony or something. I mean, having a wormery to do what I'm doing to make compost to sustain your, com is to su to sustain your containers, I think it's possible, but actually making it all from scratch. But I don't, I don't go in for like making complicated mixes. Um, or buying separate seed seed composts because I find as long as it's good quality, most vegetables will will grow fine. I mean, I do I do experiment with a few things like biochar and rock dust and things like that. So I will sometimes add things like that in. So I add things like rock dust into my wormery um, because the wormery is very biologically active, and that will help release some of the minerals from the rock dust, so that the rock dust should really um, yeah, should do, uh, should make a big, you know, should potentially help to add quite a lot of minerals into your, into your plants. Um, but it's hard with these things to actually know how much difference they make, because they can be quite expensive. Um, and they have quite a high footprint in terms of, you know, shipping rock dust from one end of the country to another. Um, and I don't think that they're really that necessary. I just sort of try with them because I feel like I should do. <laughs> um, and I think they are worth experimenting with, but just, you know, where more local resources you can use, things you can find locally, I think that's the, that's really the thing to try and aim for. Thank you. Um, the, uh, yeah, so while, while we're, I don't know if you heard me, my internet went a bit weird. So while we're in this sort of compost doctor sort of space, so OB Pearl asks, I have maggots and ants in my compost in a metal tube with holes, and I'm not sure how to deal with it. And then adds, they have just appeared on top of the compost. I think my mistake was adding rotting bread and um, fruit flies as well was a question. Okay. So I sometimes think that wormery is the wrong description of a of a of a wormery. I prefer to call them liferies because really you're mimicking what happens on the forest floor and they're full of all sorts of different life which is all there to sort of break stuff down. And most of it um from a composting point of view is fine. It's just from your point of view, like you don't really want a rat in your in fact you don't want a rat in your wormery either because you they eat the worms. <laughs> um, but things like fruit flies are fine from a composting view point of view, but you don't, but they are quite annoying. So one way to try and deal with fruit flies is to bury the food underneath a layer of worm compost. So instead of putting the food on the surface to actually put it underneath, um, hide it away. That can sometimes um, help keep them at, at, at bay. Um, ants, sometimes they get in there because it's a bit dry. Ants don't like dampness. So if you water your compost, um the dampness can help to um help dissuade them they won't do that they won't do that much harm in there so i wouldn't really worry 
too much about the old ant, um, the old ant in there. And uh, yeah, I mean, but you will find all sorts of other little white worms and uh, wood lice and uh, all sorts of things like to live. They like to live in there. I even had a fox in mine at once. <laughs> Managed to lift up a lid. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this uh, certainly the um, the comment thread in this particular session. Just to point out that you can down at the bottom of the column that the comments are coming into. If there's the button with the three dots that says more, if you hover over it, if you click on that and then you can press save chat, then you can download the whole chat and read it uh, at your leisure. Um, have I missed any questions? Uh, we've so we've got about we've got about five minutes left so um if you have a question that that is unanswered do uh, raise your hand on the on the uh, reactions thing you could raise your hand and we could take it we could um take your question so just the other, the other thing to add which is really good in wormeries is um slugs i have um something called a green cellar slug which is quite a large one and um there's quite there's some slugs that eat living plant materials but there's some which just eat sort of decaying plant material and green cellar slugs which one which just eats decaying plant materials so they're a really good one to have in a wormery because they help the uh, process i want um, those ones why is there, why have i not got any of those ones in my garden <laughs> they sound great you might have you might have rob have you got the spanish ones though have you got Spanish slugs? I don't know. I've never heard them speak. I don't know quite where they're from, really. Big or big fat orange ones, but you can hear them when they're munching on something. You can hear them. You got those? Oh, really? They sound revolting. Still, like my kids. They are really revolting. Yeah, they cause accidents actually because they they also are cannibals. Um, so if one gets run over on the road, lots of its mates come out to um, chomp on it, and then that causes a slick the more and more of them get squashed and it causes a slick and cars have slipped skidded on slugs, slugs yeah. really are quite horrible they're lovely there's more reasons not to love them I have a, there's I have a campaign we should have a campaign to love slugs i do really like slugs a lot more than i used to i must say i am really getting into slugs but <laughs> So everybody, when you've collected all the slugs in your garden, you know where to take them. They'll yes. be warmly welcomed in Newcastle. Yep. I've got you in my dress in Newcastle. <laughs> Pack them up carefully, Bo. It's nice, soft, gentle packaging so they'll arrive safely. Plenty of air holes. Fantastic. Um, nice oh, yes, here we are. There's a, so another question from Dan about your tomato varieties. Dan. Yeah, I'm back. Hi. Um, the uh, you showed a photo uh, during your presentation of some tomatoes, trailing tomatoes growing in kind of conical oh, baskets yeah. that are hanging off I don't know a wall or balcony or something. I'm just yeah. interested in what variety of tomatoes they were, and if you do anything particularly different with growing trailing ones versus growing kind of the normal kind of um, vine tomatoes. That was a beautiful photo as well. I have to say. Uh, yeah, it's called Cherry Cascade, that, that tomato. I think it might actually be an F1. I tried to find out what it was, so like a hybrid variety, um, but it was hard to find out. I didn't think it, I thought it was open pollinated, so one you can save the seeds from, but I think it might be, uh, I got it, I can't remember where I got it from, but it was a great tomato. But there's quite a few varieties of sort of ones for hanging hanging baskets, but that did seem to be particularly um, particularly good. Uh, but no, other than the fact that you don't have to train it, not really very much difference in 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 care. Just hanging baskets um, that dry out very easily, so you just have to really keep on top of the watering. And I put in a um, like a little water reservoir, plastic bottle thing, so that uh, water would drip in there and just keep them well well hydrated. But yeah, it's a nice photograph. That, that is, I like that photograph of them hanging down. It's like quite nice. I think a good tip someone gave me once is in a small space, try and think of it as a 3D, try and think of it as a 3D space rather than in one dimension and try and fill in all the little, all the little spots of it. And um, the ladders are good for that. But hanging baskets are also really good for just for sort of, yeah, giving a bit of that, filling those holes. So Jai has quite possibly given me nightmares uh, for the next couple of years. I got covered in bright orange slugs camping in France one time. 
that really is the stuff of nightmares. That's the great film that Alfred Hitchcock never made. Um, so you have a phobia of these. Uh, <laughs> How are you on worms, Rob? Do you mind rock worms? Oh, I love worms. You love worms. That's no, not a phobia of slugs. They just uh, we. It's just a a, a, a long a long running grudge. I yeah, think maybe I would say. Fair enough. Um, there was a few questions about about the, about the ginger. Oh yeah. Uh, so you know the kind of ginger that you go and buy in the shops, and then you chop up and put in your stir fries or whatever. Is that is that the same? And how does it compare to that stuff? And can you literally just grow it in a pot outdoors in Newcastle? Well, it's the same sort of family of plants, but with lots of different varieties. So that one I've got outside, unfortunately, it's an amazing plant because it doesn't need any direct sun. It will grow without it just needs light doesn't need direct sun and it grows massive absolutely massive um so it's brilliant for just filling a filling a space but it doesn't produce um edible roots so people do grow the roots from ginger from the supermarket or from a spice shop um it's quite easy to well not as to say not too difficult to grow a plant um, but it's quite difficult to get like a good, well, if you grow it inside, you have to go that one inside um, and you might get a bit of ginger to harvest, but you won't get that much. But apparently there's a variety called mango ginger, which I'm I'm not really familiar with what, what it is, but someone who grows ginger at home told me that's the one to look out for. Apparently there's a better chance, some of the Asian shops sell it, and there's a better chance of getting a yield of mango ginger from that. But no, the one I've got doesn't produce it. I just... I've just was given it once and um it's just been amazing it just grows like a like a like a triffid and just nice green and you can use the leaves actually in cooking so you can wrap stuff up in it and roast it in the oven or you can use the leaves like bay leaves to just put them in addition like let it hit flavor um it's, and it's got a gingery flavor but like a more softer sort of slightly sweeter flavor it's nice beautiful thank you and and Rakesh has been adding some useful ginger uh, tips uh, and info there. Thanks very much. And uh, again, Jai's uh, midnight slug golf uh, is something that I think probably uh, uh, will similarly haunt me for, for a little while. <laughs> um, so uh, I think we are almost out of time. Maybe there's room for one more question. Is anybody any last thing? This is your last, well, not maybe not your last chance, but for now, this is your chance to ask the great Mark Risdell Smith anything you like uh, within reason. And um, and then we will be gone in a moment. So, Chris, Chris. I, I've just loved this session. Thank you so much, Mark. I'd love to know what you find the easiest thing to grow and what you most find the most rewarding thing to grow. Oh, <laughs> that's a lovely question. Um, so um, I would say the easiest things I find to grow are all the microgreens because they're just really quick and they don't need very much sun. And even if they do go wrong, because they grow so quickly, you can just start them again. So things like pea shoots and things like that. Also all the, all the herbs as well. Most of the herbs, Mediterranean herbs like rosemary and bay and things like that seem to be, I mean, it's always fatal saying anything's indestructible because the moment you say that, then it always dies and mine will die if I say that, but they are generally, um, so I say those things are the um, easiest and probably the thing I'm finding most rewarding at the moment is actually chilies because um, I think homegrown chilies, the flavour can be so much better than shop bought. And I mean, we live in a house where nearly everything has chili in it we like like chili so and you can make loads of chili sauce you can ferment chilies to make your own sriracha which tastes so much better you can make your own sort of chili chutney i made some lime uh pickle with loads of chilies in it um you can they dry really well if you grow with different varieties do different things but the thin skinned ones dry really well um you can also chop them up uh, the fresh ones and freeze them they freeze really well so then they taste just like fresh chili so I've got whole little yogurt pots full of chopped up chili so basically from a few chili plants we have chilies amazing flavored chilies throughout the whole year so that's probably my most rewarding one at the moment but it's like all these things it changes like your favorite band you know you ask someone what your favorite band is and like it changes from one year to another but at the moment that's my favorite 
Thank you, Mark. Thank you so, so, so much. There are just a couple of things to, to say. Uh, there is a, um, a feedback form which has gone in the chat, which if you had a minute after this to fill out, we'd really appreciate it. It really helps us to get some feedback on the sessions here. There's also, Rich has just posted a link to Vive, which is the platform where you can follow up. These conversations can continue there. You can share anything you want to share over there. And I really hope that uh, that after this session, any concrete yard you come across is reimagined as a potential food balcony forest. and roof terrace and balcony and patio, <laughs> bathroom, anything yes. really. Uh, and that, um, yeah, we're deeply, deeply grateful. And do join us this evening, everybody, for the for the session about becoming our own developers. It's going to be really great. The guests are phenomenal. Um, this has been the Together We Can uh, Afternoon Summit session. And Mark, thank you so much for, for joining us. Do rush out and buy Mark's book. Uh, it's fantastic. And uh, indeed, as Jai says, let's rip up the tarmac, make fruit avenues on the streets. And uh, thank you, Mark, for this delicious taste of an amazing future. And we're just going to ask everybody to, if you want to unmute and say thank you to Mark and to bid everyone farewell, please do. And we'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. It's been lovely talking to you all. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.